Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ancient Wisdom Today podcast. I'm Shaman Durek, and I'm sitting here with the amazing third-generation matchmaker from the millionaire matchmaker herself, Patty Stanger, who is here to share with us ways for us to connect in the most authentic and loving way. We're going to cover all types of conversations, not just about relationships, but about life in general. And I am just happy here with this wise, gorgeous goddess who I'm like, oh, so happy to be here with. And i just really excited for all of you to enjoy this amazing, amazing podcast. It's such a joy to have you in my presence. Aww, I love you. You know how much I love you. I love you. So excited to be here too. Congratulations on the new setup. Thank you. Your niece gets a raise. <laughs> <laughs> she actually did the whole setup. She got a raise. <laughs> we just gave her a raise. Okay. <laughs> She's amazing. But I'm really excited because, you know, you created this whole cornerstone of what it means to really understand mm -hmm. bringing in dating to a different level, mm -hmm. not just the level of I'm going to go meet with someone or someone setting me up, but you're actually helping people realize the potential of themselves first and then being able to connect them with other people who are suitable for them. Mm -hmm. But I want to go back. I okay. want to go back to what started it all. <laughs> what started it all is I was single and, you know, single as fuck. If I can say that on a podcast. Yes, here. I'm unkind. I mean, like, the truth of the matter is my mom and my grandmother were matchmakers for the local temple in New Jersey. So I did have that kind of gift, and I was that girl. If you were at a dance and the boys were on one side and the girls were on the other, I kind of merged them. We, I used to go to these Christchurch dances. Here's the Jewish girl lighting, you know, liking the Gentile boys. And the priest literally came over to me and said, you have a gift. You need to do this for a living. And I was like, never would I do this. And when I... When the market crashed in the Garmin Center, I used to be in fashion, my mom's like, come down to Florida for two weeks and take a vacation. And she looked in the paper, and she wanted me to move there, and she saw Great Expectations, the largest dating service in the country at the time, thematch.com of its time, and said, look, they're looking for a marketing director. You could do this. And I got the job, and thus it was written. But I never thought it would turn into a TV show or, you know, become a phenomena and, you know, globally. That that was like not the plan. I just wanted to go to California and write movies and produce movies and that was my dream. I had no idea that you know reality was going to take off and here we are now. You know, it's interesting that you say that because when I in your when I'm in your presence, mm -hmm. I do feel a director. I do feel a producer. I do oh, yeah. feel someone who is a visionary, mm -hmm. who's able to want to bring storytelling to life and all of this type of stuff. Did you find that in being a matchmaker, you were actually creating life stories with the people that you were connecting with? Or did you find it difficult to complete those stories because of other people? Well, I, I did it selfishly. I wanted to know how men thought. And we didn't have a roadmap in my generation like we do today. We pretty much have a roadmap now. We didn't know the science. We didn't know the alchemy of attraction. We didn't know that men fall in love between their eyes and women fall in love between their ears. Like we didn't know any of the, the there's love languages, which is an amazing book, um, you know, and when you learn your love language and the other person knows their love language, then you can really have harmony in relationships. We didn't know any of this. So I was like, I am going to find out why men, you know, break up with me, don't date me, I don't get the right guy. I want to know all this. So I figured if I went under sidebar as a matchmaker, you would tell me your secrets. That's what happened. Oh, wow. And it was a Pandora's box. So I, I, I was still helping other people find love, you know, and I was teaching people how to become your own matchmaker, like my book. But at the same time, I was selfishly finding out why was I single and how could I fix me? And if I could fix me, I could fix anyone. What did you learn about men? <laughs> <laughs> that your dogs now, I mean, <laughs> that need to be curbed. No, um, I learned you're simple. You're pretty simple. It's not as complex as women. I mean, when you learn that a man, you know, wants to do good in order to feel good. So when they're doing an action for you as a woman, that makes them feel, you know, 10 feet tall. If you take away their job from them, they get angry, they get resentful, and they don't want to help you anymore. And that is why men on the planet love to hunt. They're trying to bring home food for the family. And we just made it really complex. Like, you know, like when a guy doesn't call you back and he goes today, you're like, well, you know, he, you know he, his mother has cancer. Maybe he's at the hospital. Or, you know, he is on, he's, is it a work event? No. 
He goes he's, to he's you. He's not interested in you. Yeah. He could come back later and submarine you is what we call when they come back up. And he could break crumb you and give you a little bit of, you know, just a taste. But generally speaking, he's not your guy. Right. And we had to learn from Sex in the City, you know, through Miranda, he's not that into you. It's not that he's not into you. He's not your guy. That's not your match. You don't say, like, he didn't like you. He liked you for that moment in time. But he wasn't the one. And we want the one. And we make excuses. Women tell stories. You know, they live in fantasy. A lot of my problems with women is that they live in fantasy. They don't come to reality. Where men are very realistic because they don't have oxytocin. So chemically, they can't bond through sex like we do. And when we bond through sex, we make a lot of mistakes. We're stalking you at 2 in the morning. That's what's wow, happening. Wow, the bonding through sex is a real deal. Yeah. I mean, definitely. Because, look, here's my theory on, and I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on this, right? Mm -hmm. So do you think, and I just want to hear your thoughts, that men should be going after women or women should be going after uh, men? Okay, it's primitive and primal that men should be going after women. Now, you're going to say, but this is 2021, Patty. You're so old-fashioned. Yeah, tell me how many men you chased... And it worked out. Now, if you are an alpha female, you have a lot of testosterone in your bloodstream. You can get it tested. If you're a woman that likes to be in charge and you like that beta, lazy, lie around guy, namaste, right? <laughs> but 90% of women are beta and they want the alpha. That doesn't mean they're not going to have an opinion. That doesn't mean they're not going to bring home the bacon because, you know, it takes three incomes to make it now. It's not even two. And that doesn't mean that you're not going to switch worlds. Like, you know, my, my wife makes the travel plan. She's in charge. She's the alpha, you know, and I go, you know, and I basically, you know, get the rental car. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't mean you're not going to have chores. Like my mother called it blue chores and pink chores, you know. But at the end of the day, 90% of the population wants an alpha male. And if the men don't step up, it turns us down. We dry up downstairs. We do not want you to touch us. We do not want to be sexually connected to you, which is what you want. So there, the legs get closed. When you are an alpha, the legs spread. It's very simple. It's not right. complicated. Do you think that a lot of that um, experience of alpha in the male and the way in the beta in the female is result of our system and the way our world was built. Like for the, let me yeah. give you an example. Um, in ancient tribal culture, for instance, it was normal for women to choose their men because they knew what the body needed to look like, what the, they could smell the, the way the sex would be just by the, the smell of the pheromones mm -hmm. and, and be able to connect into a man um, through their choice would give them the right baby or the right situation mm -hmm. that they wanted. But today in modern culture, we have been putting women down from their intuition, their ability to sense their own abilities of their own autonomy, their own sense of center. So do you think that has something to play in when it comes to how we operate in the dating world in today's world? Well, I think social media has destroyed it because we don't have se we don't have senses like taste and touch and smell. So we're in like quarantine, for instance, in COVID. Um, we are disconnected. We are now looking at this device like this is our lover and our husband and our wife. And if we don't have that connection. So primal culture is like I send off the signal. So I would tell women, you send a signal. You signal. He will come forward. The right mate will come forward. You will determine if this is the one you want. So you're actually controlling the dance, but you just don't know it because you think because you're waiting for the invitation, you know, that um, he's in charge. Mm -hmm. But it's really women in charge because they're sending off a signal. Just like when the lion's laying around and he's going to pick the lioness, these animals are sending off a pheromone. And what's happening is the lioness knows that the lion is her guy. She's walking past him and wiggling her butt, and he's going, hmm, oh, yeah, I like her. But truthfully, she knew you were the one from the get-go. It, it, it's just can, it's, it's basically programmed in our DNA. And as society evolved, okay, women were suppressed. We weren't allowed to vote. We were burnt at the stake for our intuition, mm -hmm. okay? And on top of it, we were considered, you know, demonic. Like, if you look at the King James Bible, King James thought created demonology. He believed women who were healers and intuitive were demonic and was persecuting them. So women have been persecuted. This century, with Me Too, mm -hmm. we're changing the culture. Is it going to be 
I would say matriarchal, no. It has to be a blend of the both or there will be no harmony in the culture. It has to be a blend. It cannot be one or the other. It's not like we're taking over and we're canceling every man out, especially a white man out. Um, but even like in Black Lives Matter, blending of the culture. We can't stay in this state of being and expect not to blow ourselves up like Atlantis and Lemuria. Yeah. It will happen. It will happen. It will eventually. And the earth will regenerate and it'll start all over again like it always has, but it'll happen. Totally. Yeah, that's the whole thing that I always look at is how, because in African culture, we have this idea that the masculine and feminine must always be a dance within, the, within women and men. And the moment they try to capture one and say, this is what I am, and don't let the two dance, they can't recognize each other anymore. It's like um, I found out I was Cherokee Indian because I'm adopted, and one of my teachers said to me, the, dan the, the wind must always dance between you. The wind must always bring you and so that you can come into harmony because if there's no harmony, there is no life. Yeah, I, I definitely see you as a, a medicine woman for sure mm -hmm. because you, you're, you're very wise. I, you know, I, I look at today's culture and I, I think to myself, you know, when it comes to men, one of the things that I find the most is that when I'm speaking and lecturing around the world, I notice that more women are present. If I have 500 people attend, out of that 500, there's like 400 in, let's say, 97 and maybe five men in the audience. <laughs> And they were dragged by their wives. And they were dragged by their wives <laughs> right. or girlfriends or right. a friend. Right. You know. or, they're, or they're gay. Or they're gay. they're very intuitive with their feminine side. Right. Yeah. yeah. What is going on with the evolution of men showing up to evolution for the purpose of this, what we talk about, this convergence, so that we don't return to the ways that Lemuria and Atlantis was. Mm -hmm. We don't have this destructive separation mm -hmm. because we create a chaos theory out of the, out of the removing of the synergy and pulling polarity over one polarity. How do, what, what do you feel, j before I ask you my next question, what do you feel is the thing that's actually getting in the way and let's just go really hardcore on it mm. of, of why men aren't stepping up. Well, it's conditioning. So if we're going to look at the millennials before I even get to Gen X, their parents spoiled them. No generation ever felt it was okay to live at home, right? They said, I don't care what it takes. Three jobs, put me through college. I want to live with five roommates and sleep on the floor, right? And then I'm going to get my own apartment. And then I'm going to get the car. And then I'm going to get married and buy the house. This generation is like, no, I'll just live in the basement. I'll smoke my pot and play my games. And what will happen <laughs> is uh, my parents will eventually die and I'll get the house. So right. it's like, and it's cool. It's cool to be like homeless for a week and in social media that, you know, over at like Tent City, you know, at Erwan in Venice. It's cool to do this experiment, this experience, but there's no responsibility. So the generations prior to that liked responsibility because responsibility gave you wealth, gave, yeah, you, gave you a family, gave you foundation, gave you roots. This is a generation of no responsibility. I'm scared what's going to happen when they become a president, a vice president, whatever. And I'm praying Gen X does not follow this road. So we created these younger generation that won't get married till 29. That's the average age right now. Uh, there's more women ever before on the planet than there are men, not enough men for the women. You know, we might have to go to Mars. Hello, Elon Musk. If there's, <laughs> if there's, you know, there's great, get great guys on Mars, right? You know, John Gray 101. Right. And the problem is, is men have us there. Even though they could get canceled, especially white men in America, as Joe Rogan says, could get canceled. They've got us by the balls. And women have to be in their power of saying, no, thank you. The invitation is not accept It's not accepted. You are not treating me like the goddess I am within. Mm -hmm. And if you're not treating me like a goddess, then I will wait for the man who does. And when men start to see women <coughs> closing their legs, you know, yeah. they're on strike. Yeah. Then they're going to be like, what the fuck just happened? Because they're getting the goodies. They're not even giving you pizza and beer. They're like coming to your house at midnight and getting a hookup because Tinder says it's okay. What kind of societal rules are this? It just created a disaster. Now, I don't blame the apps. I'm not blaming Bumble. And I, Bumble is a service. Tinder is a service. It's the people that come on. I saw more people on Tinder in the last three weeks, and I'm on, I'm single, I'm looking, that are in a marriage that are poly. And poly's become a problem. Okay? 
you're dissatisfied, but you have a fantastic wife, and either we're going to swing with you, or I'm going to get you as a girlfriend, and she'll get a boyfriend. Or maybe she won't get anyone at all. She's just allowing it because she can't satisfy her man. You know? I think sexual um, education needs to be studied. Not at just like, he, here is how you get pregnant and use a condom, but like, let's satisfy ourselves. I just watched a great show called Sex Life on Netflix, and there was this position that I never heard of called The Cat. And it's where the man actually satisfies the woman by taking, can I say this on, on you the You say anything okay. you want. Okay, because I know you're, you're sexual because you're Scorpio. So <laughs> you'll love this. So I was obsessed with this show. It's a very interesting show because it's based on a book, uh, the 44 chapters of four men. And um, the woman who's in the show leaves her husband, okay, in real life for the co-star, in real life. This is, is the this story. about Nicole Dodoni? I don't know if it's Sarah or maybe she, I don't know, remember her name. Okay. But anyway, her ex-husband's on Shameless. But anyway, it, she's fantastic. Writing's fantastic. Like, needed more episodes. Thank you, Netflix. I love you. I love you. But the cat was in this. So I look it up, and it's a real thing. And I, I go, no boyfriend. And I had great sex. No boyfriend ever did this to me. And it basically, when he inserts his penis in, in the woman, it hits the clip because he's below towards the chest level, not the head level. I'm like... <laughs> Let's get more education on that. You know, yeah, like, what is let, that? like, what is it? Let's experiment. And I think men watch porn and they think that we come the jackrabbit, which we end up getting cystitis and going to the gynecologist the next day. Right. And they're not getting educated. When men get educated where they want to please women, they open the car door, they ask them out, they, yep. get, they pay the valet. Yep. You can't afford it. You're a student. You could still go to the beach and make a romantic picnic. I don't want to hear your fucking excuses. Okay? When you do this to the woman, she will give you the world. She will bear children. She'll take care of them. She'll make your house beautiful. And she'll work at the same time and bring bacon home too. So what happened is the culture changed. It's like... Japan, the women went on strike. This is a really cool story. Japan, the women went on strike. They were very successful. And the guys were doing the gaming, slacking, staying at home, and they were rebelling against their very educated, wealthy parents. The parents were horrified. The girls are on strike. I'm not going to date you unless you take me out nice. Now the women are not dating the men, and they're creating these dating clubs where the parents bring the kids in to, ma to match them blind dating style and the women are like unless he pays for me I'm not going out and if he doesn't treat me right no because I make my own money now I don't need you I desire you but I don't need you and the men are like freaking out because they're on strike so you can google this it's a true story and every culture has a different way of dating China they ran out of women you know, we know what happened in China. I'm not going to go there, but we know, <laughs> right? So if you look, and then in the UK, my favorite place, which I went to recently before quarantine, and they sleep together after the pub on the first date, and then they wonder why they're not getting an invitation to another date or a relationship or marriage. <laughs> Close your freaking legs. And then one day, that guy's going to go, you slept with me on the first date. You're a whore. And she'll go, but you slept with me too. And he goes, yeah, but it's different for a woman. Yeah, it's, it's so the it's so the question is why are we doing this to ourselves? Social media, right? Social media. Social media is making you disconnected, where you're addicted to your phone, and then by the time you get there, you're exhausted. You're like, well, I don't, I don't really want to call someone and ask them out. I don't really want to take them out for dinner. That's a lot of work, mm -hmm. and I'm 25. Yeah, you know, and then you get people in their 50s, and they're watching social media and going, well. That guy, 55, got a 25-year-old. I should date her. Oh, really? What are you going to have in common? Well, we'll bang, and I'll take her on my boat, and it'll be great. And then 15 minutes later, after she's gotten three Burke, and she's bored. Right. You know what I mean? Like, like the, it, it's like what happened to what's inside of us, the intimacy, the connection, learning to laugh together, common interests. Like, n all that went away. This is all now about exposure to the outside and showing themselves in a fantasy situation, which is not real. I can tell you how people I watch on Instagram and I go, well, that marriage is over. That marriage. They're pretending too much. They're forcing that we're so in love. We're at the picnic. We're at the party. We're on the boat. We're on the yacht. We have the pictures. Oh, the my picture God. picture perfect. Every picture, every season, every this. Yeah. And to me, it's just fake as fuck. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, I look at these things and I'm like, I, my big issue that I find, because I come from a very old school mentality, you know, um, I was in the generation. Well, you're a gentleman. Yeah. So I believe courtship is number one for me. I will not go on a date with a girl or even go into an act of sex with her if there isn't a courtship 
a friendship and, a, and an understanding of me being able to show up and honor you. Mm -hmm. Because if I can't bring flowers to you or surprise you with gifts and have walks with you on the beach and get to know you, but all I'm considered about is just getting into your pants, it dies very, uh, dies very quick for me, you know? And I told this girl once I dated a long time ago because she kept trying to like have sex with me right away. And I go, okay, if we go there, I'm going to let you know that our foundation won't be strong and eventually I'll get bored and mm. I'll be done. And that's exactly what happened. It was because I just felt like you weren't willing to build something with me. You just wanted to get into that space with me. I'm okay with people wanting to have sex really quickly. That's fine. But for me, I have this way of, I'm old school. I look at the old movies that, you know, Breffix at Tiffany's and, and those types of films where you open the door, you take the girl out to dinner. When I'm on a table with all women, I cover the whole entire bill. I don't believe... That I we, love that, by we, the way. You just have to. It's but like, you, I can't tell you how many rich people don't do that. They yeah. start looking at the bill. You know, well, then why should I take your friends out? Yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. But my I, father was like you. So my father was old school. So the old school mentality has died away. And now it's 50-50. We split it down the middle. There's no romance. You know, I hate to say this, but like, you know, we're not in the Netherlands and we don't go Dutch. <laughs> and so, like, you know, this is, the, this is the Dutch mentality. And then I go home and I live in my parents' house and I drive a scooter to see you. So it's like, is this really where we're going? Is this where we're headed? Because I'm sitting here going, like, what happened? And you gave us, you gave the kids too much technology. And it's getting worse. Like, Gary Vee will say, that's progress. You know? And then I have to tell women, for every 50 guys you go through this, there's one good one. But it takes you know, time to find the one good one. Yeah. And you're going to have to be a high value woman that says no. And there's a loneliness factor. So are we going to keep, you know, saying no, 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 maybe a year or two goes by and I haven't had sex because I haven't met anyone? Yes, yes, stay that way. You know, stay that way. Because when you do have sex, it's going to be amazing because you're going to be connecting with someone who really cares about you and really loves you. It's just like when a girl's losing her virginity. You don't want her to lose her virginity to the guy who doesn't give a shit. That's right. You know, because that's going to scar her for life. That'll yeah. set the tone for the rest of the losers, you know. But it's, it's sad because the parents have to stop spoiling the children. I really believe that's an issue right now, and it's got to stop. I do, too. you got to say no and kick them out of the house. Now, maybe in quarantine, we were all scared, and we told them to come home. But once we get out of this situation, the Delta variant goes away, we're all come down, we're at herd immunity, you got to kick those, kick them out and sell the house and go to Tahiti because he's going to want or she's going to want to live there for life and live off of you and feed off of you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when I was at home growing up, I couldn't wait to get out of the house. I was like, independent. But then we had shame. We had shame. Yeah, I had shame for being there. I was like, oh, my God, I'm getting close to 17. I got to get out of this house, you know, and make my own money and make my own life. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's interesting. In our generation, we saw it as a, as a rites of passage for mm -hmm. ourselves and a way that we claim our own autonomy. So true. And, and when I look at these kids today and I look at them and they're just in the room playing video games and smoking those um, vapes. Vapes. vapes yeah, yeah, the vapes. And not really having that feeling of getting up and saying, hey, you know what? I want to do this because I want my own independence and I want to create that autonomy. I definitely believe it's about the spoiling, but I also believe it's about the laziness yes. of, the, of, the, of the parents not wanting to step up and upset their kid. Because I feel like a lot of children these days, I listen to what they say to their parents and what comes out of their mouth. I mm. would never speak that way. You know, and I think a lot of it is because parents have this kind of thing of, I work so hard, I work so hard, I want to give them everything they that want. Then if I didn't have in my childhood this, or my father did this to me, or my, yes. but you know, like the stern parents ended up, we did, we did studies on this, the stern parents ended up having great kids because they have boundaries. There's no boundaries anymore. So you're saying to your kid, you know, like, well, he's being creative. He's up at 2 in the morning. He's got to be at school. But he's being so creative. He's on the computer. He's working on a project. Instead of, like, turn the lights at 11, get into bed, you need your eight hours. You know what I mean? Or um, recently, <coughs> I had an argument with a friend about her kids. Her kids ran the show. Do you ever have that? You see those? Yeah, you go I, do. Out I do. And you go to the grocery store, you're at the baseball game, and they are just right. He's like, who's the parent here? And I said, she goes, when you have children, you can tell me what to do. Yeah, I always hear that. And I'm like, okay, fine. I don't have kids. But I raised two of my exes, and they went to college, and they're fantastic. And they didn't get along with their mother. And I said, you know, all I know is my mom raised me, and she raised me right. 
And if you do this to the children, so you, you know, they're gonna, com they're gonna cause, you're creating monsters. So two weeks later, she calls me and she, com she complains about them. I go, don't complain about them to me because you're raising monsters. And you made that choice. Right, and every person that comes in your house is the same story. Why are the kids screaming? Why are they, oh, you know, they're, they're, they're okay, they're fine. No, they're not fine. Scold them, put them in the naughty seat. You know, like my sister does with her, my nephews. But the bottom line is I sit there and I watch them, and then I go, I could totally see how what a man they're gonna be when they grow up. I could see it. Well, that's the, is that the mama boy um, mentality that these boys feel so, uh, how do you say, coveted by their mother so much to the point where they don't have a man's right of passage. I want to talk about that. Well, that's, it's very strong in the black community. I'm very close to the black community because I've been fixing them up and I have a lot of black friends and I was very bitch advocated for black biz matters. I did this whole black biz matters and I would talk to the uh, women <clears throat> and I would say, what is going on that there's no male presence in the home? Now, I'm from divorce too, so I, it's not like, you know, I don't know it. I am and, too. And, and like, you know, like Cynthia Bailey, who's a friend of mine from Housewives, we were talking about this, and she's like, there's not a lot of role models. And I say, I think it's getting even in the white community because divorce is so prevalent. You know, or we have children out of wedlock, which is a big deal now. You know, unless the man's 50-50 because the court made him and he has to see his kid, 90% of them are fleeting. They're just, oh, I'll take 20, 10%, and they're just not around. Without having the yin and the yang to balance out the child. Yeah. The child will will either get like daddy issues if it's a girl, you know, mommy issues if it's a boy. And then they get to this place where they're not functioning. So when they date, they act out the scenario from childhood and the mind only knows what's what you tell it. That's right. So if you keep telling it, you know, mommy is going to be there to rescue me. Daddy's not around, so I've got to become even bigger and stronger than daddy, which a lot of women who are successful who didn't have father presence, since I didn't. My dad was an alcoholic. He was absent. I said, then you become stronger, and now you're intimidating to a man. So it's like you can't win here, <laughs> right? So exactly. it's like, and therapy, who has time for thousands of years of no, therapy? No, no one does. So if you nip it in the bud and you say, you don't have to be like this. You can be like this. Let yeah. me show you the way. A parent can say, look, I know dad's absent. I'm not going to be there all the time. I got to teach you to be independent, to be resilient, to know how to treat a woman. You know, and if daddy does the same, you know, the opposite way with a girl, there'll be harmony within, within the soul so that they can balance it out and find they're equal in love, if not better, which is what everybody's looking for. They're looking for their water. You know, water seeks its own level. Or they're looking for better. Nobody wants to date down. And I mean emotionally, not just financially. I'm talking about emotionally. You date down, you're going to be dragging baggage all over the place. And you'll have more than one bag to drag around. And that's exhausting. And then you end up getting sick and die. Yep. Because this creates disease. Yeah. And, and for women, it creates cancer and fibroids. Like, like, like and uh, uh, breast cancer is a big emotional disease. And the other thing I think is strong is that um, we stop looking at our neighbor and comparing ourselves. We all compare. You have to work on yourself. Your pace might be slower than mine, you know? I might not find love till I'm 60, you know what I mean? But my pace is my pace. And stop going, your sister got married, your best friend got married, I gotta rush, 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 rush. The good news is we can freeze our eggs now. That's fantastic, I didn't have that in my time. So there's a little bit of less pressure on women because now they're banked, you know what I mean? Um, and the other thing is, is, is talk. one of the things I hate that women don't do, and I had, I'm had i gonna do this on Clubhouse this week, we have a talk about it. They don't ask questions. They were told not to make waves. It's very true. So they're not allowed to say to a guy, hey, what's, what's your intention here? Yeah. What do you want? What are you doing? What are you doing? What do you want? What do you want with me? <gasps> or they can't say to a guy, guess what? You're a great guy. I really like you. I think you're amazing. But I'm marriage-minded right now. I don't feel like you are. So I'm going to go find a guy who's marriage-minded. But thank you so much. <laughs> and they can't do that. They can't speak their truth. They're, it's like their throat chakra is gone. And I say the more you speak up, nicely, sweetly, not nastily, the more you're going to get quality men because your value system is going to raise. Um, Lacey Phillips is a great manifesting yeah, coach Yeah, I love Lacey. Goop. So she's, uh, she's one of my favorites because when I first saw her in Goop, at the Goop conference, I was like, eh, I do law of attraction, I don't really agree. And then I went back to her online and she says something that, that really em empowers women. You'll get triggered and tested. And the more you get triggered and tested and the more you pass those tests where you don't accept the losers, the quality of m men are gonna come to the top, just like foam rises on beer. And I said, hmm. And I wrote my list down of all the men I dated and the more I said no, 
the better a guy I got. So there's something to that, saying I will not accept less than what I deserve, and I deserve everything. I deserve yes. the best. Woo! You know? Absolutely. So holla, holla to that. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. I, I like that because, you know, I think that the, the culture of people and where we are today in our evolution, I feel like that men are not – stepping up because they don't feel like they have to. They don't have to. There's no consequences. Yeah, there's no consequences. And like I spend a lot of time with my male buddies and they're like, did you really just get like, what are you doing right now? I'm like, I'm getting a dress. I'm putting it in a box. I'm getting a ribbon. Uh, My girl's coming into town. They're like, can I clone you? Why? Why are you doing that? (laughs) That's their question. That's their thing to me. Like, why are you doing that? Because they, 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 they treat women as bitches and they don't want to give, give, give. Because they think that, like, we're cats. We have to control us, you know. You have to dominate us in a nasty way, not a nice way. Yeah. Not like I'm going to be the alpha and I'm going to take care of you and protect and provide and cherish you. It's like, you know, the bitch is going to do what I tell her to do when I tell her to do. Right. What kind of life is that? Yeah, and if Why? not, I'm not going to give her a dick. Or if I'm not, I'm right. not going to. I'm going I'm to punish her. I'm going to punish her. I'm going to go into my friends call it the the cave the cave moment uh, right. guy cave guy cave where we just we just you know we shut you out until you can't take freeze it anymore. It. We, freeze it. Yeah, we freeze you, <laughs> and then we come back and, and then see and then your and then you games. make us. But then you make a psychotic woman who goes sociopathic on you because she can't figure out. You're gaslighting her. You're not showing the truth of what the situation. She doesn't have the education to know this guy's doing this to me maybe you're older maybe you're wiser maybe you've accomplished something maybe you cure cancer and I look up to you and now I look at him and go well I gotta win him at all costs so it becomes a competition and that's really bad that's the worst place you can be in someone's gonna get hurt most likely her and your heart is closed you will never know those men don't know love they would never experience love. you know love they are sitting in a place of hell they're in fire. They don't know love. Love comes from your heart chakra. And when you love, you want to give it to the world. You're yeah. not going to go, I'm going to give you 10 seconds of my time, bitch. And when I'm done, we'll see if I even want to give you more. Like, who are you? Yeah. You're not. That's a dictator. Yeah, that's you know? crazy. That's not love. So the women get addicted, especially if they're younger and unexperienced. They get addicted to this role playing. The cycle of abuse is what I call it. And you can look that up online. That's actually a psychology term. Yeah. And then they start all all over again. You know, I'm going to give, 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 take away, take away. She goes crazy, psychotic. She does everything to win him back. He starts, then she decides maybe I'm going to leave. Then he starts up all over again. No, no, don't leave because I'm going to give you more. And the women need to know those men are super unhealthy. They're diseased. Get rid of it. They're COVID. (laughs) they're They're COVID COVID. they're COVID (laughs) they're COVID and that virus will spread (laughs) and you will be stuck in suspension and lose your window of beauty and warmth and angelicness that men are attracted to because you'll age and as you age you less become valuable to society in dating. I don't say that. I don't say that But the society either. does. So the so- especially in L.A., we see this in Los Angeles all the time. Like you see all those actresses, oh, she's not fuckable anymore. Let's get rid of her. Yeah. You know, but they don't say that about a man. No. no me- Liam Neeson can, can act till he's 90 and he'll yeah, be fine. That's right. I want to still fuck him. Right. So um, when this happens, the women are causing such a cycle of suspension for themselves where they never get to where they want to be because they don't work on themselves because they don't realize that they're the problem by accepting the invitation. That invitation should have been a no. Absolutely. I mean, and you can say, look, I dated you. I made a mistake. It's not really what I want. That's why this show, Sex Lives, you're going to watch this. This is what happens to her. Does she go for security for the husband who's cute and handsome, but maybe he only wants to have sex once a week? Or does she go for the horn dog who is gorgeous, has money, and treats her like shit? So there's this combination we go to. Do we want the bad boy? Is it ingrained in our DNA? Or can we get to the place of getting both? I want the confident guy who's secure, who makes money, who takes care of me, protects, provides, and has still great sex. Can we get it all? And that's what everybody's trying to get. And what about the whole competition thing, Patty? Mm-hmm. Like people, like women will go into this idea that I have to go into competition yes. to, to get oh. him to see me, to like me. But then in truth, they're just playing a game with themselves. Well, I think what happened is there's not enough role models out there to go, listen, I was in my power. I was in my presence. I know who I am. I go to a party. I'm not the prettiest girl. Okay, but I got a great personality. I'm interesting and engaging. 
and I will go home with the, the, the best quality man at the party. How did she do that? So, you know, the peacock comes over, and she's dressed like all scantily clad, and she's sticking her tits in, and she's wiggling about, and she doesn't get that guy. But the, guy, the, ner the nerdy girl, maybe she's in sneakers and jeans and whatever, and she walks out, and she's like, how the hell did she do that? Because she was in her power, and we don't teach that. We don't teach that. Right. It's not about... It's an inside job. It's not an outside job. But you think because you're watching social media and you're seeing JLo's of the world and you're going, I'm going to emanate that because look who she got. Look who she got. That's not the way it works. Right. The inside person is going to get that long term who loves her for life. When a man falls in love, he doesn't care about your makeup and your hair and all the, you know, the, 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 the boob tops you wear. The man sees the inner you and goes, I'm in love with that woman. That woman makes me feel so good. That woman empowers me. I want to stay with that woman forever. And you look at Pierce Brosnan and you look at his wife and you go, how the hell did that happen? She was pretty when they first met. But, you know, he's ten times better looking. And you go, because he's in love with her. I can see him look at her. I went to an event. He was sitting behind me. And I was just like, that's fucking love. You know, and he doesn't see what we see. Like Shallow Hell. Yeah. Like one of Paltrow's movie. One yeah. of my favorite fucking movies of all time. He saw her for who she was, you know? And it's hard. We don't have a lot of confidence right now. Women don't have a lot of confidence. They are obsessed with plastic surgery and you're looking younger and feeling like a man's going to leave them if they don't have X, Y, Z. You're getting girls at 16 getting Botox now. It's, it's insane right now. They're looking at Kylie Jenner and they're looking at all the Kardashians going, well, they did all this. I have to do this in order to get them in. But if you look, look, I love the Kardashians. I think they're great. I worked with them. But every one of them doesn't really have love. It's right. all messed up. Right. And they're not choosing wisely. You don't want to be that woman on an island with all the money and a kid and nothing, no one to share it with. So you have to say to yourself, you know, work on the inner you. Work at, if you need boobs, go out and get boobs. That's going to make you feel better. Yeah. Namaste. Yeah. But the inner you is the where the satisfaction is going to come in. And if you don't work on your spiritual self and you don't work on who you are as a human being and why you're here in this world and doing your passions and your pleasures and whatnot – it won't matter. It won't amount to anything. That's the problem. That's the real problem. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and the one thing that I will say is, when you go to a spiritual class, which we talked about, a thousand women will be in the room and five men will be there. Why? Because men don't give a shit. Women want to find happiness. They will work on themselves till they bleed in their fingertips. And men are just like, yeah, it's a bunch of bunk. You know, they might go to church. They might go to temple. They might listen to their, you know, their leaders in that department, and maybe they're religious in that way. But 90% of the population is not like that. You know, they're like going, hey, listen, I don't need that law of attraction crap. You know, like it's so funny. The millennials now are obsessed with the word manifestation, and Secret have brought it out for 100 years. And I did Abraham since 1989 yeah, Abraham with Esther Hicks. and Jerry. I've been going there since. And I said, when, why all of a sudden? So when I created Manifesting a Soulmate or my Manifesting a Soulmate room on Clubhouse, it blew up. And of I was course. like, because the word manifestation, we were, so we were shocked. It was like, this has been around forever. Like, why are they all of a sudden? So maybe this generation will get their head out of the gaming community and start going into the spiritual community and learning the job's up to you dudes like when we're gone the whole planet's yours what are you gonna do with it yeah nothing right? like nothing you're gonna sit in the basement and play games all day long you know yeah. <laughs> or are you going to become like Zuckerberg and try to be a, you know, a, like a dominating dictator? Right. Right. That only cares about himself. Like, what are you going to do with this? At least Elon Musk is trying to like do something creative and genius. You know, he's still in the spectrum, but he's still like smart as ass, you know, you know, and, and he's trying to do something for the planet. Like, what are you going to do with this time? Yeah. What are you going to do? And they don't, some of them just don't care. They don't realize like, yeah. I believe in reincarnation. I don't know if you do. Yeah, of course I, I do. Believe, I'm a shaman. Right. So, okay. So we know we're here and then we're going to have to reincarnate again or wait till or go to a different level of existence or a different plane. But these people don't know the debt they're incurring on the karmic scale, which I always blow people's minds. And I said, do you know how much karma you have right now? Like, you might want to clean that up right now. You don't want to come back 10,000 lifetimes, you know, because they don't care. They just don't, they don't know the repercussions. There's right. no consequences. They don't see the rippling effect of how they're affecting the lives of other people and how that actually comes back to them and reverbs back to them. I think that that is very true. And I think also, too, that where we are in our trajectory of humanity, 
there is this um, real off balance because men are not stepping into that space. We say in African shamanism that the two have to become one. So it's the the feminine, the masculine merge into synergy. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, the chaos then disappears on the planet. The chaos is only there because there is a separation between the two not being able to see themselves so they can't see each other. The first thing my girlfriend said to me when we first um, fell in love was, I had to see myself in order to see you. And oh, that's beautiful. That I beautiful? love that. I love that. Isn't that amazing? Oh, she's, God. she's, she's so evolved. She's, yeah. You're going to, yeah. I can't wait to meet her. You're going to love her. And, you know, what I find very fascinating was that when we started connecting and coming together, mm-hmm. a lot of people were making comments in the press and saying things like, well, why would you be with a shaman when you could be with another prince or you could be with a whatever? And what she, she laughed one day and she said, because he sees me. Right. And and when she was with the prince, he would like one of her stories that she told me, which made me laugh, was that she would be sitting across the table from him and he she would be like, oh, I had this dream last night and these things happened and I was flying on this dragon and all these different things. And he would pull his paper down and go, that's nice, dear. And he would right. pull it back because, up. Because basically it was a societal relationship which had to keep perpetuating their species in the royal family. And like, do you have that much in common? Now, when somebody becomes really spiritual and the other person stays back at the ranch, maybe they're religious, but they're not spiritual. That's not the same thing. Um, the person starts to go, yeah, I need I need different type of person. I need to question where I am. I need to change where I am. Change is very important. And when they do that, they outgrow somebody. That's yeah. why I always believe divorce is not till death do you part. I believe it's till there's no growth of the soul. That's a and, good one. Why, pe- why do people say to death do I don't, you Because part? it was like an Old Testament thing because they controlled the woman and the woman had to obey. Remember, obey was in the, oh, in the yeah, marriage that's laws. Right. So I was like, yeah, till death do you part, like in, as though we're mates and soulmates forever. But things happen. Things change. My mother was married three times and every man brought her closer to the man she wanted. Um, I do believe that smart people see the truth. I believe somehow you got to work on your smart gene inside of you because everyone's got it, but they let it sit and dormant and fester. When you start to get really smart with life, things show up. You know, the universe aligns and you get signs, lots of signs, and you got to follow the signs. Most people don't do that. I think also that most people are so, um, you know, like complacent, which we talked about laziness, and they really don't care. Caring is a big deal. Like, you know, I was talking about the apps. Apps don't care whether you find love. They just want you to get super likes, boost, you know, put you to the head of line. <laughs> yeah. apps don't yeah. care. I mean, like, uh, matchmakers care. We need you. There's a part of us in our DNA that wants to succeed in finding love because it's a calling. It's like being a nun. And there's the other part they want you to tell 10 people because that keeps the business going. But the bottom line is we wouldn't do this job if we didn't care because it's very exhausting as a matchmaker. When you are um, on an app, or any kind of situation like that, social media situation, that thing is wanting to make you get addicted like you do in Vegas to the sca- to the gambling. Yep. You know? And you don't realize it's up to you to change your life. They're not going to change it for you. So if you don't change your life, you can still change another app. You could go to a party. You could ask a friend out. But if you don't make the action, you know, happen, you'll end up, Cinderella sleeping the f- sweeping the floors in the house with the ste- stepmother, and there's no prince coming to rescue because he's pretty much dead. Yeah, you know, like absolutely. I tell women that. I said you got to make your own music. Now we were talking about human design and us being projectors, and anybody can look that up. Um, we're supposed to wait for the invitation, but like you and I said, if we waited for the invitation, we wouldn't be who we are now no, because we, we didn't learn about it till later in life, and most people don't know the system. And I thought about that. I said, yeah, I'd never be the millionaire magic. I would never strive, so we would never come out of our shell to grow and evolve because we'd have to sit and wait. I don't like waiting. Waiting irritates me. Yeah, it irritates me too. Right. So when a man waits, uh, uh, this is a cute story. So I was on Tinder the other day. Good looking guy. Don't, when you're on Tinder, you don't know anything about them. So you have to ask questions. Where do you live? What do you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he comes in and I said, oh, where do you live? How dare you ask me where I live? How come you didn't compliment me first? I deserve a compliment right now. And I took a screen grab of this because I was like shocked the anger and rage that's online, and the man wants you to chase. Now, that's Tinder. Bumble attracts passive-aggressive men. They want you to chase them. They're literally saying, you ask me out, you pick the restaurant, you this. And that's not what Whitney was creating when she created Bumble. She wanted better men for the women, so she wanted women to be able to choose, right? But the man that's attracted to Bumble is like, well, women pick me, and, you know, 
Yeah. The alpha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? But yesterday I saw it on Tinder, and I'm like, Tinder's getting it. Oh, my God. This is a disease sweeping the nation. <laughs> like, this is like, I must come in. You and I need to go in and change this shit. Seriously. Because I was like, how? And I took a screen grip because I was like in shock. How dare this man think that? Like, where did he, where was he raised? He's in his 50s. He's not a baby. Where was he raised to believe that he's the woman in this equation? Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because um, one of the biggest issues that men, well, when we look at it from men, and I look at it from my perspective mm -hmm. and what I've, what I've learned about men and women is that women want you to just show up and hold space. Men want you to tell them how sexy they are, how good in bed they were, how they rocked it last night, how amazing they are. When they hear the, the kudos coming in, they get lit up and they want to give you more. And it's a very interesting thing because men have so much insecurity because when we're growing up as young boys, we are always taught that our value is dependent upon what someone says we are. Whereas women want to be heard, seen, and experienced in who they are. And so for men, when I, when I deal with listening to my male friends, I go, why are you arguing with your wife today? And he goes, well, she didn't even acknowledge me. She didn't even compliment me. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, she didn't even compliment me, tell me how good I looked, you know, all this type of stuff. And I go, oh, okay, yeah, because I got it because the insecurity and the this and, normally, and the that. And normally he would, he, she, he'd give a compliment to get a compliment. Like the first thing someone you say, you're so beautiful. You go, oh, my God, you're so handsome. Like, yeah. like we're normal. We're going to reciprocate. Yeah. But we're not going to be the initiators of it. First of all, we don't want your ego to get so blown out of space. And number two, we don't think that way. We think that way like, oh, if you did do something, like you took the garbage out. Oh, my God, honey, that was so nice of you. I was about to take the garbage out, and you did that. like thing, Or you walked the dog. Oh, my God, honey, I had such a stressful day. Thank you for walking the dog. Or you picked up dinner. We're going to be all over you and lick you up, you know, face to the feet. But the problem is men today are asking too much outside you know, their sexuality, because it's basically men are this way and women are this way. And we can't change the DNA. We're programmed this way. Yeah. That's the part that people don't realize. It's like there's a science to this. We're not like when they say, you know, like the feminists go, well, I don't want my car door opened and I don't want you to make a reservation. Great, great. Stay over here. OK, and give us the men that will do it because we don't we're not just because we want equal play for equal dollar doesn't mean we don't want our car door not open. Yeah. You made the reservation. You sent me roses after the meal. I dated those women. Yeah. They hated everything about me. Right. And the truth is they don't belong in this kind of society. They belong being the alpha to the beta. So they would be better with a beta man. Go find that beta man. Just give me my alphas back. That's what I say. And we have a disconnect. So then the kids, the kids are saying today, well, I don't want to open the car door, and I don't want to pay the valet. And I, there's like the 20-year-olds on, online. And I go, where did you learn this from? I go, well, I dated a girl who was older, who was 30, and she told me she didn't like that. So I said, all women don't like that, or just she doesn't? Right. So they make a decision in the moment that I hate the absolutes because, you know, no two people are like, they're like a snowflake. And I go, everybody makes this decision in the moment. This happened to me. Therefore, all people are like this. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Okay, that is bunk, you know? Like, stop making these decisions in the moment because this is fucking your life up. Yeah. You've got to undecide. That one person may be not for you and did something really awful to you, but it doesn't mean every man's going to do the same thing. Yeah, I dated girls who I'd open the door for them. They told me I had male chauvinists. I would oh take my them God. out to dinner. I'd buy them jewelry. They'd throw it in my face. Like, who do you think you are? Are you trying to buy me? What am I, some kind of, like, dog some kind of animal you're buying so when i met uh princess marta i was doing the same thing and i was kind of like uh oh what's she gonna say and then she really liked it and i was like wow other girls broke up with me for this reason and you're loving it no she's european she would be raised that way but the the american women today are trying to be this like alpha macho woman and i'm like no that's not how you're gonna get a man he's, right. you're gonna reduce seduce and reduce him into nothingness because he's not gonna feel confident and the american male right now is very insecure he's afraid to get canceled you know? <laughs> and by the way, it's not just white. Oh it can God. be black. It can be Latin American. It could be Asian. Everyone's getting canceled. doesn't matter who you are. You say one thing wrong. Chrissy Teigen. I love my Chrissy Teigen. You know, getting canceled. And so it's a society now where we're afraid. We're not going into the house. 
You know, we're hiding. Like, I have A-listers calling me every week and going, where are the men? Where are the men? They're not, where are they hiding? I'm like, Joe Rogan said they're hiding in their house. They're afraid. You know, so it was like that kind of a thing. And they're not coming out. The world has changed. This quarantine thing was a good thing and a bad thing. It was a, it was a little bit of both. It was a little bit of both. Right. It's yeah. not 100% like great. And I'm not talking about those who died and I'm not disrespecting. Yeah, yeah. I have I'm, the same I, feeling. I'm talking about like it hurt us to go more inside that we now don't leave to go outside. I think people are afraid to go outside. But I want to um, I want to spin it back a little okay. bit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I want to go back and look at mm – -hmm. You, so you, you, you know, you're in Florida, you're, 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 you're going into this matchmaking, you didn't have your mindset on it, you didn't think about the whole fame and the success part because it mm -hmm. didn't even cross your mind, no, right? No, But then it happens. I remember my EP calling me, get ready to get famous. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I still don't feel famous. I mean, I've never felt that way. I think I'm just like you know, Patty from the block, like, so to speak. Because, because you're dab. Yeah, because I just feel like it can go away tomorrow. It's not real. And I really did it to get my business off the ground. It wasn't really to become famous. I don't really like fame. I don't like social media. I, I'm having a hard time with it. I don't post enough. I get yelled at constantly. I like my privacy. I like my downtime. I don't want to look glam 24-7. It's a pain in the fucking ass. Excuse, excuse my French. <laughs> you know, like I didn't roll out like this today. I had hair and makeup just like everybody else, you know. And um, I don't always look great, you know, and then you got to put a filter on. You got to be like, real. you know, I could do wisdom chat all day long, but, you know, it's draining too. There's a lot of energy that goes out when we do this like you know from teaching and whatnot but I would say that the show was a really cool experience because I went to film school and I really didn't understand how a network works when you work at a news station or something it's not the same as working at a reality show so I got to see the producing side of the business and I learned the producing and I was very fortunate to have people at Bravo who were willing to teach me because it's not like you can go buy a book and say hey this is how you make a reality show and this is how you come like I came up with the title you know I worked with my development exec I came up with the format the format was mine the mixer was really something I really did it was on CNN for years they always put me on the news when I had a millionaire mixer and it was more than one guy it was, it was like 20 guys and like 50 girls um, also, I think watching how to do a budget and learning how to, you know, be cost effective because in those days there was the free, we got the free location. Now you don't get it anymore. Right. And there so was, the line the, right. There was line producing and there was this whole thing like, how are we going to get a celebrity on? We don't have the money for that. How are we going to do this? I learned these tricks of the trade, which was fascinating. Then I went and I was smart every year at Bravo. We have a big, um, like a TCA upfront kind of thing. And they bring in the people at Bravo who get to walk the carpet with you. And I always ask for analytics <laughs> because I wanted to know what, how I was testing. What are the top 10 markets? What kind of content can I create? I literally went to my, develop my EVP and I said, teach me everything. And that's what I did. And I absorbed it like a sponge. Most of the people in Bravo, probably 90% didn't do that. Maybe Jeff Lewis did. But I really produced. I found locations. I brought celebrities on. I worked my butt off. It was fun. It was rewarding. It was exciting. It was exhausting. You collapse after you do. Like, I think I did one season. I did 18 episodes. Now, that's a lot for me because I'm one person. I don't have a housewife where I can pass the baton. Right. Down. It's so just it's you. Th like they're 26. So that was a lot at the time. We had a huge Valentine's episode that season. I did one with Andy. I did a reunion show. I mean, we had a lot of fun. And when we passed the 100 mark, I was in shock because that's technically syndication. So when you pass 100, it's like you're in the golden seat. Like Supernatural, I think it's 300 episodes. Yeah, exactly. Like I can imagine that back end Ooh, give it to me babe. yeah right so um yeah right <laughs> so i passed the hundred mark and i got to produce the entire episode with cynthia bailey and kenya and my friend taylor jane they were all my friends and very hard to get the housewives of atlanta i had to beg production on their side please let them out and they gave me their vacation they were so sweet to me the girls like no no we're going to come out we're going to shoot and they don't make a lot of money they did it for me as friends taylor too she lived close 
and we knocked that episode out. It was the most beautiful episode I think I ever I got the suits from the men's warehouse, you know, the tuxes. Yeah. And my showrunner and I went to town because we begged to get this. We, it took me years to get celebrities on. I begged every year. And it was the hot one. Of the, I think it was the highest rated show in history. And I think it was the hundredth episode, which was really nice. That's a lot. So of that episodes. meant, yeah, that meant a lot. We did one oh seven, and uh, that meant a lot to me. Um, that my friends came out and helped me. I was really impressed by that because you know they were, th- th- you know, Atlanta Housewives are number one show. They're big shit. You know, right. It was like, whoa, you're gonna come to humble me. You know, so sweet. It was really sweet. So when you. Let's talk about a hundred episodes. That's a lot of episodes. Yes. Right. A lot of time. Eight years. How do you maintain like keeping yourself in like the self care <laughs> and like when well, you're constantly y- shooting? You and kiss ass your chiropractor and your massage therapist, and you give them lots of goodies at Christmas because you know you're going to be using them left and right. That's first of all, <laughs> and you get that bathtub ready and those sea salts because you got to get the demons out of you at the end of the day because you know you're in line a lot of people. Um, I am the person that will work 16 hours hours then collapse when they say cut wrap done for the season I will collapse you know and I will I will hide and regenerate you know and go into hiding like a bear and then come out you know and then I got to get skinny again for press so it is a cycle it became my full-time job I did have my staff running who you saw on the show yeah running the business but it became my full-time job and it was my baby and I did love it and I did love the whole experience. Plus, we blew up a network. I was like the third or fourth show on that network. Yeah. You know, I mean, there was Jonathan. He he did blow out, and then he went away. And we always had the actor studio, which you know, you know, James. But the bottom line is, um, it was Housewives of, of of Orange County, and then it was Jeff, and it was me, and we were the three originals technically. And it was really exciting time because we were like, the only thing on the air, I think, then when I came on was Survivor and the Kardashians just started. Yeah. So it wasn't a lot of people. We had the real world, which started the whole living in a house thing. The Bachelor, we had that. That was a whole other story. I actually created The Bachelor for telepictures. It was called The Millionaire and it was a deal that went south uh, due to an agent that I'm no longer with. But that was another experience. And that was the actual format was the format I created for Millionaire Matchmaker because it was the mixer, which is Cinderella at the ball. If anybody looked yeah, at it, it's yeah. the same exact I love thing. It. But, you know, I never got bitter. I didn't sue or go, you know, crazy or call my agent. I just said, oh, I'll get the next one. And that's kind of who I am. Like, like I don't get revenge. I give it to God. Yeah, me too. Because I just know they're going to get theirs. And they're going to figure it out that they made a mistake someday. You'll get on a, maybe you'll get a poverty. Maybe, maybe you won't. But, um, I got nervous at one point because the expectations started to get rising. Like, you got to do better every year. You got to get more sponsors to buy ads. Like, it started to get nerve wracking in the last few years because the stakes kept getting higher and higher. And I started getting nervous. Could I keep doing this? Will people get bored with the format? Now, if I went back, I'd do a completely different format because the world in dating has changed. Like, yes, a millionaire has. matchmaker 2.0. And I've always wanted to go back to camera. Well, you know. We'll see. I had a great project at Time Warner. I was really excited. It was about me dating. Me dating. But they wanted to put me in Antarctica. I have no idea why. <laughs> and it was, I, I don't know, it was like a twist. And it was with Scout who did, um, Scout who did Queer Eye. And we were in pre-production. And then quarantine happened. Everyone got fired at Time Warner. TNT, even the new president got fired recently. And it all went south. But, you know, I was so excited because I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to find love on camera. I'm going to be the bachelor, yeah, yeah. which would be my fantasy. Yes, bring those men. Right. I am ready. The goddess is within, you know. Right. And so I was really excited, but it went south. But, you know, you'll get the next one. That's what you do. You go, go get the next one. I'll get the next one. I'll get the next one. That's how it works. And when you were at um, this show, uh, Millionaire Matchmaker, that was your show, mm-hmm. did you feel, what were some of the, the, the high points that you felt were high points? And what were some of the low points? Well, you know, originally it was made for ABC. And it, uh, Simon Cowell was the original producer. Then he went away because he got sued. And then Ryan wanted Ryan, Ryan you know, Seacrest was shaking a deal with me as Bravo was seeing a clip of me on another show that was about people who made a million dollars in their business in their first year in business in their underwear. And I was one of them. And I had to leave Ryan, which was really sad because I really wanted to work with him. But um, the highs and the lows were creating a virgin product with no roadmap. We had nothing to compare ourselves to. We had no, oh, yeah, love is blind, or I could do, you know, too hot to handle, or I could do you're the one. 
they didn't exist. Yeah. And I kept saying, will people really watch this or they get bored? Because I was like, it's the case of the week. And every now and then I'd sprinkle my personal life. It wasn't a lot. Like I did, I was engaged when I started. He refused to go on. And that was a big problem for me because I was like, well, you want me to be a part of your life when you're in your business world, but you won't come on my show? So people didn't even believe I was engaged. And then the second one came on and he was a dating down situation, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very nice guy. Dating down. Right, and I can't do that. So I didn't have, to this day, this bothers the most of me. Sometimes the expert has to face their own music. I was listening to Matthew Hussey, great story. He had a bad breakup, and he had to learn how to master his mind. My friend Marissa Peer has a, has a podcast he went on. And he said, you know, she goes, when was, the, when was the time you had to master your mind? And she goes, when I had the biggest breakup in history, which is probably Camila Cabello, who's with Shawn Mendes. And he had to get himself out of zombie state and get back to productivity and teach people this is what happens when you break up and this is what you do. Well, I'm in that state of I'm single trying to find my soulmate. And I don't know what's wrong with me. You know, like God doesn't go, hey, Patty, this is exactly what's wrong with you. And you've got to go on a Tuesday at 7 o'clock to the street corner and there he's going to be. And I have to walk the walk just like them. So as much as I'm old now, I am dating with the millennials, learning this new landscape of how to find the one. And it's really hard because you're facing your mirror. It's not that easy. You know, Ka Carolyn Mace said, you know, when she got cancer, she's like, wait, I've cured all these people of cancer and I can't cure myself. And she was on Oprah. And I remember thinking like, oh my God, talk about a karmic test. I hope I never have to go through that. But in some ways I'm going through my own karmic test that way. And that's humiliating it sometimes. It's embarrassing. But I'm facing the music head on. You yeah. Know? I love Marissa. She's an amazing woman. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you're going through these periods, mm -hmm. like you're on the Millionaire Matchmaker, you are Patty. You, right. Everyone is loving you. <laughs> I love, I mean, I watched you and I remember watching you <laughs> one day. Unfiltered. <laughs> I remember watching you and I was going, we're going to be friends one day. <laughs> you know, and my sister was like, what do you mean? I was like, we're going to be friends one day. You'll see. Uh, because I connected into your energy so well, but mm -hmm. I also saw behind your energy, mm -hmm. right? I saw the part of you mm -hmm. that could see greater than what was actually mm -hmm. being put, what was being shown on television, right? Mm -hmm. Because there are times where I would see you look at a girl mm -hmm. and you would know what her true intentions were mm -hmm. and why she was there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I would catch you, you would kind of like roll your eyes a little bit, mm -hmm. but it all came back to the idea of what I ended up th seeing that you saw in the beginning, which was she wasn't really serious. She just was playing games and mm -hmm. wasting your time, right. right? Did you feel that by doing all of these things that you were doing in The Millionaire Matchmaker, that there was this part of you that was also taking from that experience and learning deeper the spiritual ecology of the world of dating and oh, relationship yeah. Yeah. and how human beings really interact. Well, I mean, I was trying to bring spirituality to the game. It's not that easy. Um, a lot of people don't believe in it. But I still use my intuition to move the cheese. Like, I still have to get from point A to point B by the end of the episode because we only had one date. Um, and sometimes they went away for the weekend, but we only had one date, and we had that mini date at the mixer. We don't get a lot of time. It's not like The Bachelor where you have, like, three weeks to get to know someone. And we also... Um, I think if casting today happened, it'd be like more like The Bachelor. Robin is an amazing casting agent, and so is the people over at um, Kinetic who did um, Love is Blind. I was really impressed with all those marriages. So I think people now know they could go on television and get engaged or get married. You know, like 90 Day Fiance. Yeah. And those days, it was like, no fuck way. I'm just going to take a date and get the hell out of here. Now if Patty went back, the game stakes would be up. It would be marriage. Yeah, do yeah. you remember from our time, it was the dating game, right. remember? They oh, said, yes. Remember they had yeah. a wall? Yes. And they had like three girls in a chair. Yes. And be like, what would you do if I did blah, 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 blah? And then she'd be like, well, I would put, um, I would massage you with oil and put this. <laughs> and then he would say, and uh, contestant number one. You remember that? Yeah, <laughs> because that, and Love Connection too. And those, Love Connection. Those were like the only shows, but the game was just get a date and get the hell out and you're on TV and you made it. Now the game is like, I'm really looking for a wife. So they find these people that are quite unusual, like in Love is Blind. 
and they were looking to get married and they're willing to get married without seeing anyone like married at first sight you know what I mean and then there's an experiment like who stays and who doesn't I mean a lot of the experts don't believe it's anything to do with sexual attraction or chemistry I'm not one of those experts I believe that that's good and much 70% of the deal and so um it's like if I went back, it would be a way more serious. It would still have its fun, flirty, and screaming at the millionaire and throwing him out. Yeah. But it would be a way more serious show because I would be probably doing weddings, which is what Bravo really wanted. It's just that we don't have enough time because we shoot an episode a week, and time is limited. Yeah. So when you were doing the show, did you were those millionaires this uh, really serious about looking for a girl, or some, some of them were, just wanted to get on TV? No, some were really serious and psychotically serious, and <laughs> others were like, "Fuck no, I just want to be famous and show you my muffin company or something." I think it was a muffin man or a bagel man. I can't remember. Um, yeah, we had crazy. We had look the one rule we did have, which nobody knows to this day, which I will give you a secret of Bravo's Millionaire Matchmaker, is that we had an amazing showrunner, Catherine Vaughn, and I loved her in the early days. And she said, "Here's how it's going to go: We need to save money, so the millionaire is going to pay for the date. So give me that Black American Express card, dude." And a lot of times they go, they did like, "Oh no, I'm not paying for the date." So I remember this is a sad story. I remember Jason Davis coming on. Um, you know, Brandon's brother. And he comes on, we called him Huggy Bear, and he says, I want fireworks and I want monkeys. Now, mind you, this is Oil Davis Millionaire, right? Grandmother's put him in an apartment, got railroad tracks up his arm. I am flipping out. I'm like, please, God, please, God, don't let him die on me, because I was nervous for him. And there's like, you know, it's like Fabergé eggs everywhere, and it looked like you wow. know, Russia had, in, had decorated the apartment. I looked at him, I said, this is Grandma's apartment. He goes, uh-huh. I go, and you're looking for a, a wife to drive you because you lost your driver's license because they revoked, and he goes, uh-huh. And I go, <laughs> you're, no, you're only getting married because you want to get out and get your, you know, yeah, ju your juice, right, right? right? He goes, uh-huh. And so he comes out, flying monkeys, and I want... um. I want firecrackers, and I said, great, give me your, your black Amex because I don't have a credit card. I said, what do you mean? Grandma took it all away. And so he, we got one monkey and one little sparkler. Wow. So, so wait, so all of that gaudy, yeah. gaudiness, he didn't have a credit card? He, it was all grandmas. So you would get the millionaire that boasts about his money, and then you're like, okay, great. You can take her to Vegas. Can you get a private plane? And then you have a quiet millionaire who never boasts, and he'd be like, I'll take a plane. I'll get a suite at the whatever. I'll do this. I'll do that. So it was kind of like Jimmy D, this guy from Chicago. was like a I mobster. Jimmy. And Jimmy comes in, and he's like, you know, he had two episodes, and people were like, you know, he, like, planned that whole thing. He paid for everything. So we had a rule on the show. You want to be a millionaire? You got a screen. You got a pass background check. can't have anything, you know, like you get restraining orders, hurt a woman, whatever. And then at the end of the day, we um, we made sure they had the money. But the best was season four in New York. It was all mostly women. And that's a whole other gate. And then, of course, we did gay. And then we did, I really wanted to do trans. I mean, we had Alexis Arquette call in, but she was sick. And then she eventually died, God bless her soul. Because I was so excited, and the, and the family said they'd come on. And I wanted Chris Evans' brother, who was gay, too. He had called in. We had people calling in. And sometimes probably go, nope. Yes, yeah, no, and you'd be like, why'd you say no? Like, we don't like her. We like this one. And it was like shocking how many people they didn't like that were A-list. And I was like. Yeah, bless Alexis Arquette. Yeah. I was friends um, with Alexis yeah. in old school New York. And I freaking, like, they lived near me in, um, I lived in Short Hills in Jersey, and they're from Maple, where, where yeah. my mom's from. The and Arquette so, like, family. Right, so I wanted to meet Rosa Rosanna, because I had seen her since I was mm -hmm. a kid, suddenly Susan and all that, and I loved, Cor I love Courtney. She's, like, my favorite. I, I love my Patricia. Yeah, you know, and so I wanted to meet Patricia. Oh, my God, amazing actress. I wanted to meet, and David, and David ends up marrying one of my friend's friends, and I met her right before she met him. And I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. I'm always, like, six degrees from that family. But... What's weird about it is, like, trans wasn't trans yet. Yeah. We didn't have, you know, um, what was the show on the, on the big the big transsexual show? I um, can't think of it. What did, on Amazon. On Amazon. Where the guy plays know. the trans father. I don't watch a lot Okay, of so it was a very famous show. It probably, I watched your show. Somebody's going to call in and say what it is, but my, I'm, I've got, you know, COVID brain right now. And so um, we didn't have a lot of, we, it took us forever to get Chef K, who is the gay yeah. millionaires. You know, she's a female gay millionaires. And, you know, Charlie Sheen's chef and Denise Richard's chef. And she ends up going to win the taste and she picks the wrong girl. She picks the bi-curious girl. And I go, no, 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 that girl's going to leave you. You need to go second girl. And she goes, no, I'm taking the bi-curious girl. And the bi-curious girl leaves her. 
she ends up marrying the second girl. So it was like, no. Oh. And that was when marriage was legal. So we did some. I would have liked to see more marriages on. I would have liked. I ended up becoming a minister so I could marry them. So oh, we would have gone on further, <laughs> and I think we would have shown more of my personal life and shown me dating and my friends and my celebrity friends and what they're going through. I think we would have gone deeper and earlier down the road had we stayed. It was unfortunate. It was a it was a business situation that went wrong, but I love Bravo and I'd go back tomorrow. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. I think that's amazing because, you know, I think that you were the greatest thing that happened to Bravo uh, and next to Jeff. Uh, what was his Jeff name? Lewis? My, Lewis. He's I, my best friend. At the I network. love yeah. Jeff. Yeah. Love Jeff. I just think that, you know, there it's interesting because I think that you've created that whole energy for mm. the whole dating world yeah. because people weren't really watching dating no. on TV it, at that dating time. Dating was hard it, to get on the air, it, let alone in cable. Like you had The Bachelor, but the first three episodes were millionaires because <clears throat> we were in talks to do this. And when my deal went south, they gave it to Mike Fleiss. They said, because he had done Who Wants to Marry a Millionaire, yeah. who did a brilliant job. Him and Rob Mills did a brilliant job on the show. And I wasn't bitter because Chris, I thought, was amazing at the time. Um, what went down recently, I'm not getting involved in that. I think that they do need more black culture on television. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, I, I was very impressed when my analytics department said, I'm going to tell you a secret. You have a large black audience. I went, what? What do you mean? I'm white. They go, no, 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 they love you. And then when I'd go to the airport, the TS, TSA girls were all black would grab me and kiss me and touch me. And I'd be like, and anytime I'd be in a restaurant, they'd be the first one to say, thank you for doing the show. And I was like, oh my God. So I made sure we were diverse from the beginning. Everyone, had, like when Melissa Ford came in and said, I want all black men, I'm like, I'm doing that for you. Like I made sure I gave them what they want. You know, I didn't yell at them if a black guy came in and wanted a white girl. Like I, I'm not that girl because love is love. But, you know, I sprinkled a few in. I did a little, like, hey, try this mulatto flavor. Or try this, yeah. like, Chinese flavor. Like, like, I wanted people to know that we were diverse. And I always gave them the option. But love is love. What you're programmed in your brain is what you want. And nobody can say, like, you're racist because you don't like your own kind. That's a bunch of bullshit. You know what I mean? Love is love. So um, we did that. It was fun doing those mixers, though. I had a great time planning them, coming up with really unique ideas. That was creative. That was the creative process. And then I think also um, dating is hard. It's work. I'm not going to lie. It's not easy. I would love you to say, like, hey, you think it and believe it and see it. But we have baggage. Yeah. And, like, <laughs> I, cre I created this um, – thing with Joe Vitale called Attracting a Soulmate, which is a program which rewires the brain. We use isochronics and biochronics and subliminals and meditation and hypnosis with Steve Jones. And we change the way your brain thinks because you just can't expect to go out six nights a week to the bar and you're going to find the one and then you don't come home with anybody and you're like, what's going on? It's like your brain is pushing whatever is there away. So if you're a girl that likes bad boys, and we want you to like a good guy. You're going to go to the bar and only pick up bad guys, but there could be 20 good guys, and you don't see it because yeah. the brain is programmed to know what's familiar, which is that guy is the guy that always fucks me over, but I have great sex, so I'll just go with him. Yep. The frequencies actually match based on what you're actually creating internally. Right. So attractingasoulmate.com changes your brain. Um, and I think that the more I'm learning how the brain works, I wish I'd know this in my 20s, the less we would speak so negatively to ourselves. We speak so negatively to her. We have no praise for ourselves. We put her down. We're not good enough. And Marissa Peer, one of my closest friends, will say over and over again, you know, everything comes back to I'm not enough. I'm just not enough. And if we can change this, I'm more than enough. Yeah. The world will be our oyster. But it's hard. Look, I have problems. I have issues. I was adopted. My father wasn't there. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we all have these crap that's going on in our brain, but it doesn't mean you can't fulfill your desire. Well, do you think that the whole idea of it not being enough comes from this consciousness that, you know, that the system created a God that makes us afraid of it mm -hmm. and that we are going to be thrown to hell if we do this, or we do that. So it actually, you know, it makes us hold back our expression. And then we start thinking, well, because the way that our brain is wired, mm -hmm. our brain is a protector. So it's there to fix problems as Marissa Peer has right. talks about a lot. And if we look at it from that perspective, wouldn't it be fair to say that the reason why people think they're not enough is because they're looking for something wrong in themselves to correct in order to be loved? I think it's fear. 
and I think it is a God mentality, and I also think it's a comparison mentality. If I look at her, she's hotter and smarter and prettier and skinnier and yada, 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 and she got him, and I don't look like that. So now how could I get the same kind of guy? Right. And, and that's what they're doing. So everything's visual. We're all visual right now. You know, this is auditory, and that's great, but what's happening on Instagram and TikTok is making you feel like you're not enough. And then you're saying to yourself, I'm not good enough, so I'll just hide in my cave because why should I go out into the world? I'm only going to get, you know, burned, basically. Yeah. And I think to myself, but that's not what it's about because there's a place for everybody at the table. We don't all look alike. We don't all, we weren't supposed to look alike. And if you can keep comparing yourself to others, you know, like you're never going to get anywhere. Look, the great singers of our time, Barbara Streisand, Rihanna, Adele, they didn't look at other people. They enjoyed their music. Right. But they also knew they had something special within Celine Dion yeah. was the first one to tell you that. So if you basically take what you do, which makes you extraordinary, you know, you'll be surprised who loves you. If you, if you let your light shine on your talent, I don't care if you're an accountant or a garbage collector. If you let your light shine, it magnifies to the universe and those who are worthy will come forward because that's the secret sauce that you're worthy enough to accept it. Yeah, so you so you have all this knowledge mm. and where would you say all of this knowledge and wisdom comes from? Because I love speaking with you. Oh, thanks. And I love the wisdom and knowledge that you have. Where do you, where does this come from in you? Because you have so much <laughs> wisdom, my love. I think a lot of it's pain. I suffered a lot. I didn't create suffering, but I definitely went towards suffering. I didn't know better as a child. Um, I think it's it's my research. The first thing I got when I got my encyclopedias, which we all get as kids, right? Remember encyclopedias? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine we had to look at a book to find something? Yeah. We can now g what was Google? Or, or how about the card thing yeah. in the library? Oh, my God, the card thing in the library. So remember we had to do bibliographies? Yes. Okay. So I remember getting the encyclopedias, and there was a book series called Man, Myth, and Magic, and I've always been attracted to the occult. My parents thought I were nuts, you know? So I read this book from front to cover, and there's like a series. Every, every year I wait for the next book and the next book and the next book and I wanted to know about witchcraft I was really attracted to magic like how do you manifest how do you bring things forward nothing to harm anyone yeah. but for my own personal yeah. game my parents were going through a really bad time in their marriage of getting a divorce my dad lost his money and I was like well how can I help the family as a 12 year old and create some kind of magic so I was obsessed with that so the more I learned the less I knew but the more the journey began. So yes. it would start out like, okay, does Judaism, Judaism really work? No, there's a lot of flaws in that one because where's my Bashir? Where is he? Okay, and then there's a lot of like Christianity has got a lot of flaws. Well, I'm not going to damnation in hell. I don't believe yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Right? And then you would start going to Buddhism and, you know, no offense to Buddhism and no attachment. He left his family and he made his wife become a nun and then he goes off to enlightenment. He has all these children. I'm not a fan. So then I'm like, okay, we'll go to India. Well, they're a poor, starving country, and I don't really resent. Re re so I didn't, I didn't really resonate with anything. I do do transcendental meditation. I do do that because I believe that it, it works. The system thing works, but overall, I'm not going to suffer. My ex was was part of the Golden Door with a Yogi Bhajan, yeah, the and he door. suffered a lot, and that relationship couldn't get off the ground because. Yogi had find him his wife, and he had to follow these rules for hundreds of years, and we just, you know did not work out and he had a lot of damage from that relationship and the Kabbalah right and then I studied the Kabbalah that was like that because I went to Sfat I went to Israel so it was like everything had a loophole that didn't work and I was like okay where are the answers went to a million psychics went to a million I, I studied astrology I was like oh no no the answer started living in and when I heard a voice a clairvoyant voice teach me about other people I was like well now you need to help me and it wasn't so easy to get it to help me with me I had to learn how to slow down, calm down, get into my center, and then hear my voice. Sometimes I was wrong, sometimes I was right. But the more I did it, the better I got, the more I was right. Yeah. So the more I knew what was right for me. Um, I don't believe that there's one size fits all. Yeah. There's no absolutes in this world. No. It doesn't exist. Nope. Um, I studied Edgar Casey very strictly. Yeah, I studied the Akasha Gracie. I was very involved with the R Institute and like, you know, really getting involved with their work and stuff. 
um, met Kevin who runs it. And I was just like, okay, I've been reading about him for years. I went to Israel because of uh, Edgar Casey, like as a Jew and saying the J word, it was like, hmm, my mother's like, you're seeing Jesus in this house. I'm like, yeah, and he was a Jew. Hello. You remember that? So I was very into the Essenes and learning about the magic, you know, how they manifested water in the desert, you know? And I was like, what did they do? So research was my God. The more I researched, the more I learned, and the more I go, okay, well, there's something out there. Tried every avatar out there, went to Amma, went to John of God for two weeks. Came back from John of God, very interesting. So you go there and you make these three wishes, and every day he blesses you, makes you take his pills and passion flower, gives you, like, I was one of the lucky people that got crystal as a sign, because that means you're, like, highly evolved. And um, I kept saying, you know, I'm here for love, I'm here for love, and I had a guide who was my guide who didn't speak English. And I had to translate it. This pain in the ass girl wants love. Does she fucking know what love is? Love is a pain in the ass. Why did she come to John Agatha? Why do I have to do this? And he was very angry. So the translator says, oh, he's really angry. We might need to switch it. And I go, why? And she goes, he's getting a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> so here's this person who's so negative no. about love <laughs> is going to be my guide to John of God for three weeks no. who hates love. And I said, oh, my God, is that like... So he had apologized to me. He had to come down. Like, they made him apologize. They were like, you can't have her. She's a millionaire matchmaker. She will spread this to the world. And I'm like, right. no, I would not do that. And then I said, what's your problem? And he sits down and cries. And he, I had to help him, like, for two weeks get over his wife. <laughs> and, and someone translated. And the bottom line is I came back. I go, I didn't get my cluster headaches healed. I didn't get my, um, my soulmate. I became non-materialistic. Right. I, the materialism just went out the door. I was like, I looked at my shoe closet. I was like, why did I do this? Like, like I could have all this money in fed countries. Like, you know, it was just really strange. I could buy a goat right, for someone. Right, I could buy a goat for someone. I could plant a tree. I could do whatever. I could adopt five kids in a village. And so at the end of the day, I was like, okay, this doesn't feel right. And then start things started falling away. Bravo fell away then. It was like, okay, maybe I was too material. Like, I bought a lot of shit for that show, you know. And then I go to Wii, and I get robbed. The enti my entire wardrobe gets robbed on the set of the Wii show on the Million Dollar Matchmaker, one of the first robberies in Beverly Hills at, my, um, at the hotel. And now I'm really tested because I've lost vintage jewelry and things that I really loved and my fur and this, whatever. No, actually, I didn't have fur because I don't believe in fur. I had leather. Sorry, vegans. I had leather. And everything was stolen. They didn't steal my... Cheegan, be a they, didn't, they had lots of Gucci belts and shit like that and purses. And I... And, um, it was really funny. So I had, I had a bunch of fake Birkins, like we all do, by the way, and really good ones, actually. And we figured out who did it. They had a, they had, we, had, we, we caught the guy who robbed me. The state says that you can't um, take him to court even though you have fingerprints because no one saw him. So he gets off. He's had like a million priors, right? We're not in a three strikes thing. And we figured somebody on our set who's an inside job. And so we knew who they were. And I'm like, aren't I lucky? that those were fake Birkins and you should see their faces drop. Mm. And I was like, and this is a test because yeah. now I've lost all the shit that belonged to me. My mother gave me a very expensive necklace for, and I just said, you know, they're things. Yeah. I have my health. That's it. And I like let that go. So I did get something from being in Abadanya, which is the crystal community where, you know, John of God lives. But Ama, first couple times felt amazing. Last time, Russell, Russell Brand was standing over me, and she's hugging me, and she's really shaking me. And I'm like, yeah, I don't feel anything. You know, and I went to Mother Mara, and I was searching for the avatar that was going to give me the fix so that I could find my soulmate, and it didn't work. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because it's, it's the whole idea in what I always say is that, you know, we, we have to let go of the guru right? And really step into the self, right? And the self is where you, what you're really seeking inside is the, to upgrade more of your powers. Exactly. Right? And I think people get so caught up in looking for that guru, for mm. that shaman, for that person that they think is going to fix them. Even today, I was with a, a client and they said, oh, you know, thank you for changing my life. I'm like, I didn't change your life. You changed your life. I just put the keys in front you of you. You were the catalyst. That's it. Yeah. I just put the keys in front of you and said, open up your cage, dude. Yeah. Right? And it's like, there's a point where you know, we have to get out of this, this, um, this codependency and mm -hmm. into this autonomy mm -hmm. spiritually. 
And uh, so I, I'm really happy that you actually took that journey because that journey just led you back to you. Right, right exactly. And But it was good. It was validating to know, like, I t and the one thing I tell people is when you're studying a process or you're going to a spiritual place, you don't have to take everything. Take the nugget. Like, I'm a big Sedona goer. My best friend lives there. And I go there all the time. Now, I went to Manchester to do the same shit, and I didn't like it. I, I don't care, like you could call it Atlantis, Lemuria, whatever, you know, St. Germain, all that. It didn't feel like you my frequent. No, but Sedona feels. So I go to cleanse Sedona, bathe in the light in the vortex, and I take nuggets. There's stories about Sedona. There's stories about, you know, Shasta. I've been to other spiritual places. Mm, everything didn't resonate with me. So when you take a process, like you go to the forum, like Est back in the day. I yeah, did the, I, oh I did God, the forum. Est. I did the forum. Oh, so my aunt was an S leader. Oh, my goodness. And I got, I had, this is a very interesting story. So someone was sitting next to me in a wheelchair, and she had to go to the bathroom, and so did I. And he's talking, the leader. Now, S wasn't close the doors. You could leave. So I get up to oh, push her out because her handler's not there. She went out to take a cigarette break. And he screams at me, the leader, how dare you leave this room? There's 300 people in the room. How dare? Do you know what you're going to miss? And I was an Abraham Hicks, 1989 yeah. junkie. Yeah. So I said, if I'm not here, that's meant, I'm not meant to listen. Come on, let's take you to the bathroom. A woman in a wheelchair. He's literally screaming at us, a woman in a wheelchair. Now, at the end of forum, I didn't like my leader. There was a guy who forgave the Nazis for taking his family away in the Holocaust. That was an amazing moment. We we're all crying and weeping. And when we do the fear exercise on the, I think the second or third night, there's a fear exercise. I said, okay, so I'm going to take away that I, I need to let go of my fear. I went there again for love to fix my life. Who did I forgive? My biological mother for giving me up. Didn't even know it was going to happen. So you get nuggets. Yes, I, I you don't agree like that. like what Oprah says. The reason she does Super Soul Sunday because it's a nugget thing. If I give you, I tried to give you a whole spiritual network. You didn't accept it. You know, Gabby Bernstein talks about this. You, sometimes you won't accept it and you won't look at the sign. Okay, but I said everything gave me one little nugget that I took away, and I, go, I don't want that anymore. I don't need that. I w I didn't go full on, you know, groupy. You know, like a lot of these are groupy situations. There's yeah. tons of it. oneness. You know, I was in, I was a deep shot giver. Like oh, I, I wow. did oneness for years. Like you know, and I was like, you know, when when Tony Robbins put it at the end of yeah, the, I'm the not whole your good oneness. I'm like, you didn't even <laughs> thank them, and they gave you all this sh like shit. You know, you know, Shreemah Babin. And I listened to his music when I get massages. So I didn't take it all in. I didn't go full on crazy. There was taste, which was another sexual deviant thing. That's like the next Nexium. I I got offered a million times pressure. Come to taste. Come to taste. It's around the corner of your house. I'm like, no, I feel that's a cult. I'm not going to go over there. So you, you, you have to like process. Um, I know Indian Oxen, uh, India Oxenberg and her mother. And when Nexium happened, I had been in a cult when I was in my 20s. It was very small, very famous psychic, A-list psychic. All A-listers went. If I name the names, you die. And we were in this little tiny cult, and she tried to con mind control us. Very similar to Nexium. And I worked for her as her personal assistant for three years. A witch psychic, I'll call her. Won't name her name because I don't need to get sued and get into a whole thing with that. I'm too smart for that shit. Yeah. But the bottom line is, I said to India, I was 26 when that happened. I just had an abortion, lost the baby, whole thing. Guy wasn't around. I was very, my parents had left. I was like lost, just like she was. And I went through the same experience. And we were talking about that. And I said, you know, there's big cults and there's little cults. There's little cults in every community. You just don't see them because they're not going va 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 voom on the internet or in a movie or some documentary they make on Netflix. But there are people mind controlling people all over the place. Absolutely. And that's a cult. Any way you slice it and dice it. It doesn't have to be religious. And I said, I was in one of those. And I know exactly what you went through because I remember like I left my third year there, called my mother, said, get the jet fueled up, like get me out of here. And she got me on a plane and I left in the middle of the night, like sleeping with the enemy. I love and the it. scars that I had, my mother went, to, she, they, I had been beaten, everything. She went to touch me and I flinched the first time she touched me. She said, oh my God, what did they do to you? And the because of the trauma. Because of the tra she yeah. had, I was beaten in the name of Jesus and all this shit. And I went through this and I never talked about this. I always said I'd make a movie on this because it was the most traumatic experience I ever have. I still have nightmares about it. And I processed it that that was then, this is now. That doesn't define me. I had to go through that for some reason. There was some kind of karmic connection that we agreed to be to. She was in love with me, the, the woman. She was bisexual. And um, 
she did some things to me that were not pleasant and I just said to myself you go through these things these traumas but it doesn't define you and it makes you stronger and you know better and if I had a child I would know them I teach them how to like look for those kind of people yeah because they're very seductive and very powerful and rich you know like Scientology shit and I teach people that and it happens in dating it happens in dating, men and women, gay or straight, pink polka dot, doesn't matter, pansexual, bi, whatever. Happens, control happens in dating. It does. Mm-hmm. It does. I've been in those relationships. Patty, I am, I, I mean, you know, we're going to have to do a part two on this because <laughs> you and I, we, we can, can t- go I know, on I can, and on. I can, I can hear, hear your hear niece going crazy and going, come on, cut, we've already finished. Cut, cut, cut. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. I feel it too. But you and I can talk forever. And I just really, yeah. you know, want to say that, I'm really happy that you're here. I'm happy you're on the planet. Thank you. And I'm just honored that we're friends. And uh, can I plug one quick thing? Yeah. So next month, my book, The Millionaire Expert, comes out. It's like an audio book and a a printed book, and it's basically teaching people like you and me. You're at the ready, the good level. But a lot of people are experts in their own field and don't have a following and don't know how to get branding or a book deal or whatever. And I basically going to teach them how to make a million dollars as an expert, so they can make it from their home. In the you know in the oh, warmth this of this great. place, so they don't have to leave their house. And I'm going to teach you what I did and how I became who I am and whatever expertise you're in. Oh, I think this is amazing because yeah. yeah. there's so many women uh, of color and so many people in the world who need that. And I think that is such a beautiful thing and what a beautiful offering. Yeah, I mean the black women in the community have been so loving to me. I've been helping them with Black Business Matter, so I let people go on my Twitter and my Instagram and promote their products in the black business community and we had a lot of people I'm just you know more can come on any time but the millionaire expert.com you go to you register and you'll get a book early you I know you get it like before it even launches because we want to help everyone in quarantine more people left their jobs than the history of humanity they are not going back to the man no. They are creating and defining their own businesses. You yes. see it on YouTube and TikTok. These kids make gazillions of dollars. So are older people in the community. Retirees are going back to work to create a program for themselves from home. Yeah. You know what? This is so amazing what you're sharing, and this is so needed. And thank you for bringing this to the planet because there are so many people who need this type of care and just knowledge and information because, like I said, you know, we are at a time right now where people are feeling helplessness and there's a lot of change that needs to happen and that change can only happen when people start seeing the power that they have. People lost their jobs. So they, if they go back to the man, they go back to the same person for less money because they lost money unless they're Jeff Bezos, which, by the way, still reduced the amount um, for influencers on in the, the, you know, the Amazon program. It used to be 8%. I don't think it's 3 So people have to create their own jobs right now because yeah. they lost their jobs. And a lot of people are unsatisfied. So they're not going, the millennials aren't going back to work. They're refusing to take the job again. Yeah. Because they get, <laughs> look, they're living in mom's house rent free. It's like they might as well come up and come up with a concept already. <laughs> so, pay, so they can pay mom, uh, you know, mom for all the food and laundry that she's been doing, right? Exactly. <laughs> right? How else can people get in touch with you, my love? Oh, they can DM me or Patty Stanger, obviously, on Instagram. And I have a socio tap on there. And I don't remember my community number. <laughs> I have a community number that I'm supposed to be using and talking about. But I don't remember it, so we'll forget that. Yeah, I'm terrible at this shit. See, I it's forgot. Okay. I, I brain fogged. It's a 310 number, and my <laughs> assistants are like, brain, you have to memorize this. Okay, so yeah, there's community number that'll be like in the show notes. And, um, you know, you can always just find me. I go to millionairesclub123.com. You can register if you're a millionaire, and if you're not, it's free. Fantastic. I fix people up, all races, can all we creeds, get, can all we religious. Get my, my older niece, my manager. Yeah. The hot one? Yeah. Of course. The one that's going to Magic Mountain today? Absolutely. Yeah. And your your publicist. Absolutely. And Tanya, we've got to get her. Yes. Because, I mean, we can't have her date succubuses. Succubuses. <laughs> Psychic vampires. <laughs> yeah. Who steal their energy, right? Yeah. That's LA, by the way. That's LA. <laughs> like, we, could do a whole, we could do a whole show on <laughs> oh LA. Oh, my God. That's exactly what I was talking about last night. I was just like, there's people who like who are in my life who fill me up, and then there's people who come and like Shaman Dirk, Shaman Dirk, Shaman Dirk, Shaman Dirk, Shaman Dirk, Shaman Dirk, Shaman. I mean, Shaman Dirk is not gonna guess your underwear. I'm sorry, like you know. Oh, I hate that. I hate that. Read me, read me, read yeah. me. Like, no, the job isn't about reading you. The job is about you reading yourself. Yes. And they don't understand that. I get that in Clubhouse all the time. I'm like, dude, I can't read you. We have like t- twenty thousand people in the room that want their 
you know, their question asked about dating. Yeah. You know, and they're like, just read me, just read me astrology, please. And I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. But I I'll, I'll come, I'll come into your room. I'll do some readings for yes, you. Yes. Yes. Well, you did that thing. Where's my soulmate? You healed me. Where is he? <laughs> we, we, you know what? I'm going to yell at him now. No, right? we have some things still we have to do, you know, but we'll get to okay, it. Okay, good, good, good. Because it was really <laughs> funny because he's like, you're healed. Like, you did that that whammy thing in the in the room. It was really cool. Oh, yeah. I wasn't saying you're healed. You I was know what I mean? Saying, like, yeah, yeah. We're like clearing, you're that we're clearing, clearing yeah, the, the energy. energy. Yeah. yeah. So that way you're just attracting some someone who's actually showing up in a way where they are presently yeah. aware mm -hmm. versus like, being somewhere else in their mind and not present with you. So anyway, I just want to thank you for being here on Ancient Wisdom today. It was an honor and a blessing to have such a powerful goddess who's wise and Aww. has so much spirit and love and passion and is really here to create change on the planet. Yeah. And really, I really love everything you're doing as far as the business, helping thank people with you. the business and everything. And I, I'm just, I'm here to support you 100%. Oh, well, namaste. Thank you for <laughs> letting me have you here. Definitely. No, really, this was a really, I, I'm so excited for this for you and it's going to be a hit and I love being here. Oh, love you, sweetheart. Yeah. yeah.